Nation. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to episode five of your weekly movie rewind. Here once again is me, your host, Garrett Neal, and you're listening to this show on Radio DePaul, Chicago's College Connection. And as always, we're going to start off with that box office rundown. We're going to go through the top five, then we'll go through some of the news this week, which will mostly consist of trailers that were released uh, on the Super Bowl, Super Bowl during that were shown during the Super Bowl. Some after, and obviously, Solo was technically released on Monday, and then we will end on those new releases, and we'll also touch on the top five. Super Bowl uh, opening weekend movies, uh, just because I wanted to. I thought it thought, would be a fun thing to look at. All right, without further ado, let's get right back into it. Jumanji retook the top spot in the box office this weekend. That's going to bring its number one box office total to four weeks. Not four in a row, unfortunately for it, but does get the four weeks as Maze Runner had a big drop up, but Jumanji's going to take this top spot at $10.9 million. Just a 32% drop from last week. This this was a pretty pretty slow week in general just because it was uh, it was it was Super Bowl Sunday and Super Bowl weekend. So it's never a big weekend, but even so I think this was uh, about a 12% drop from last week if we're going by, uh, or from, not from last week, last year, if we're going, last year's Super Bowl weekend, if we're going from the box office mojo numbers, which, as usual, are the ones that, uh, that, that I use primarily. And that's going to bring uh, Jumanji's global uh, total to, or no, total domestic gross to $352 million. Uh, which is it's closing in on Spider-Man 2 to be the second highest grossing Sony film of all time domestically. Uh, with Spider-Man 2 is 373.5. And I think, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Jumanji crossed that in, in two or three weeks. But it's going to be, oh man, I mean, <laughs> Black Panther is just going to suck up so much of the market i don't know it it's jumanji's really got this this next week is going to be its last chance to do much of anything and then once black panther comes out i mean then then we're really in the uh we'll really be in the thick of things then uh, cuz uh, i mean after after that I mean, the week after that is not too much we have annihilation which we'll we'll talk about that a little bit later but that, that might be good. Game night's got some buzz. And then once we get into March, once we get into March, it's, it's yeah, it's all over. But I, I think it'll get close, but I, I just don't know if it's quite going to pass that. Meanwhile, as I mentioned, Maze Runner with a big 56% drop, coming all the way down to $10.5 million in its second week. Close to first, but no cigar for the final Maze Runner film. No surprise that it had that drop. Uh, it's pretty much hit its target audience. Most of them have seen it at this point, and, and that one I think will continue to drop significantly next week. Winchester, our one new release, the horror film based on a true story uh, in that house where Helen Mirren was the wife of uh, the guy who owned the company that made guns there, and the, the people... Supposedly the ghosts of the people that were killed by the guns that were made there were were haunting the house. That one that one opened opened up to uh, a respectable nine point uh, three million, which is respectable at least to the studio's expectations and the uh, Super Bowl weekend that it was opening up on. I think that's 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 decent. Um, you know, yeah. Yeah, not bad. And the number four, pretty much the consistent number four, the greatest showman, still hanging around, still has not left that top five. This it did dip under its opening weekend total for the, I think the first time since its opening weekend this week at uh, seven point seven million, now bringing its domestic total up to one hundred thirty-seven million, 
and that makes it Hugh Jackman's second highest grossing non-X-Men film, which uh, is just behind Les Mis, which finished with 148.8 million domestically. That one, I, I would be very surprised if Greatest Showman did not finish as Hugh Jackman's highest grossing um, highest grossing domestic film, not X-Men related, because, I mean, just how few drops it's gotten. Uh, it'll continue to drop, but I think, you know, if it still gets around six million the next couple weeks, then then it's it's then it's done its job it's passed it um even though we will have uh, another kids movie not that this is necessarily a kids movie but a, a a new kids movie this week which might steal some of that audience because that hasn't really had a lot of competition recently although we did have paddington 2 and that didn't really seem to affect it either so We'll see. I think it'll definitely it'll definitely get there. Uh, rounding out the top five is the post, the most important film of the year. I actually saw the post this weekend. It wasn't it wasn't bad. I don't think it did anything bad, but outside of like the the story, which was very interesting and brought up some good points, I don't think it did anything great. Obviously, all the performances from the actors were great and uh, but it just it, it it didn't really feel like I knew the characters themselves it was just kind of historical figures names placed in front of actors that that I, I recognized and knew and I just kind of bought into them being this person and I was going like okay that's fine but I don't really feel like I know who you are but this the story was poignant a little too poignant at times they they kind of kept bringing it up which which got a little old by the ninth or tenth time and they definitely focused a lot on the battle between the government and like free speech but i don't think they brought it up a few times a bit but i think they could have brought it up more is the battle of between like the press and quality over quantity because i think that's also something that we need to take a note of uh in in these trying times blah blah blah, blah. um but yeah overall solid people are, are certainly still liking it is that one that one has hung around in the top five the last few weeks i mean pretty much since uh it's wide release in the beginning of january it's been hanging around there uh, but it'll not be there next week because we're going to actually have some opening releases that will make money and it's not going to be the Super Bowl weekend. Um, yeah, and the top per screen this week was A Fantastic Woman, which had $12,848 per screen, opened in five screens, or didn't open in five screens, but it was in five screens this week. This has been getting a, uh, a lot of very positive reviews. It's about a woman who is a waitress and then also a singer uh, as her as her side job and uh, her longtime uh, boyfriend dies and it's kind of about her coping with that at least that's what I gleaned from the various descriptions I read I haven't seen it obviously because it's only on five screens and I don't think one of them is near me although maybe in one of these slow weeks coming up I might try and and see it if it comes near me but Always interesting to look at that per screen because it's a good way to look at kind of what some of those up and coming up and coming uh, indie films are, and especially once we get later in the year, that can where you get like those sneak peek at like what the big Oscar films are going to be. Because um, I know uh, "Call Me by Your Name" was a per screen darling for a lot of this year, and so was "The Phantom Thread." Although "The Phantom Thread" we knew was going to be an Oscar film because had Daniel Day Lewis and. Uh, the Paul Thomas Anderson involved. Uh, but that's going to wrap up what I wanted to talk about for the box office. So let's get into the news portion. One thing I wanted to start off with that at this point is kind of old news, but I just want to bring it up because it was, it was just something that kind of caught my eye, um, was uh, Rotten Tomatoes and Black Panther. There was like an anti-Disney hate group that was on Facebook and on Facebook they organized a event to review bomb the Black Panther 
and this is the same group that had claimed responsibility for review bombing The Last Jedi on Rotten Tomatoes, and Rotten Tomatoes came in and, and kind of shut that down and denounced it and said, like, we have measures in place to prevent stuff like this happening, and I just thought it was interesting that, uh, I'm, I'm, it's one of those things, it's like, I'm glad, like, we don't want people just review bombing a movie for reasons that don't really have to do with the movie itself or are, are, st like, stupid reasons, like, the, like, oh my, like, there's, I, I don't want to, I don't want to get too much into stuff that we're not really supposed to talk about on the station, but you know, you know what I'm talking about with, with Black Panther, some reasons that they might not like that movie that aren't really reasons to not like that movie, and, um, like, racist reasons, really, and because that, that was some of the things that had supposedly, according to this article on Polygon, uh, had been brought up by this group, uh, but then you you that but then obviously that's like obvious hate speech but then you gotta wonder like how are like you don't want rotten tomatoes then just preventing negative reviews for for like well, like where's the line there obviously that's a complete slippery slope argument and and it's has a lot of fallacies in it but it's just an interesting point to bring up that like like it's good that they're doing it here um, but you, you, well, it'll be interesting to see if it might come up in future scenarios where it's a little less black and, and white, um, which, uh, that was kind of a bad phrasing there, but, um, moving on very quickly from that, let's talk about trailers. There's a lot of trailers as always during the Super Bowl. I was a little disappointed because I think the trailers were just about the only good part of the ads of the Super Bowl this year. There was a couple... A couple fun ones. The, the Eli Manning, Odell Beckham Jr. ones were all right, especially when they got the dirty dancing at the end. That was very fun. And then when they got to uh, the Jeff Goldblum Jurassic Park Jeep ad as a Jurassic Park junkie, I was, I, I loved that ad. It, like, it wasn't amazing, but it was just, it was just fun to see Jeff Goldblum and fun to see Jurassic Park. Speaking of Jurassic Park, Jurassic World had its second trailer debut on uh, during the Super Bowl. I keep seeing on the, like, what am I... Oh, my God, I'm a terrible person. Not really. But, uh, I mean, I am, but, like, whatever. <laughs> um, Jurassic World. Trailer number two. I'm... I Gosh, I... I'm, I'm someone who really, really enjoyed the second film because it was really stupid. The characters were terrible. The plot was terrible. But it didn't really take its plot seriously, I don't think. And I didn't come into it expecting a good plot because I could tell from the trailers that the plot was going to be terrible and that the characters were going to be terrible. But I thought the action was just so cool. And, like, that, that ending fight was one of the most amazing scenes, like, I've ever seen. And just, like... When the Mosasaurus came out of the water in the end, I was like, my, my, my jaw dropped. I was like, oh my god. All my childhood dreams are coming true. Uh, these, these are the scenes that I would like play out in my basement when I was playing with my dinosaur toys. But now I could see like what it would look like if uh, it actually happened. But the dinosaurs didn't really look like they were there. But it was good enough that I could believe it. But this one... I kind of got this vibe from the first trailer, and I definitely got it from this second trailer, that it still has the feel of an action movie. I mean, there's a there's a volcano coming down to blow up Isla Nublar. Like, we know that. And so they're bringing in this team to evacuate some of the dinosaurs, most notably Blue. Like, great, whatever. But, like, there's fire coming down everywhere, and, like, I've, almost every scene we've seen in these trailers is just, like, tinted orange and red. And so it's just giving, like, that feeling of destruction and explosions and we're still dealing with these same characters that are not going to be any more fleshed out we've got weak characters we've got like explosions and destruction going on all the time and like giant dinosaurs everywhere which is just still like these hallmarks of a dumb action movie but the tone of the trailer has been gearing so hard towards suspense and thriller and horror and it's going to be in the same vein as, as the first Jurassic Park movie but I don't think it has the capability to do that. And if it's going to try to some do something that it can't do, it's going to 
it's going to be fairly disappointing. And so I, I, I hope it doesn't do that. I, I hope it surprises me. But we did get some cool things. I think like it opened up with like the dinosaur creeping up on that uh, girl in her bed, which was really weird. But I think that was kind of a first glimpse at at the Indo Raptor, which is the new dinosaur that we're going to get in the film and I'm I'm super excited about that. I'm still excited about the movie, but I don't have as high hopes for it as I as I once did. Uh we had a uh let's see skyscraper, the new uh Dwayne Johnson movie. I like even that Jumanji's still in theaters and, and we already got uh, a new Dwayne Johnson movie coming out in a few months and Honest, like, it looks like Die Hard with a fake leg. That's been, like, the joke that's been going around. And it's, he he's with his family in this skyscraper, super tall building. I think it's at, like, 240 floors or something, which I don't, it doesn't exist in the real world. But, like, I'll buy into it for a Dwayne Johnson movie. Uh, but, like, they get trapped and then there's, like, terrorists coming in. It's like raid the building, so it's Die Hard, but Dwayne Johnson has a fake leg, and it looks like it's going to be the most run-of-the-mill action movie of all time, but it has Dwayne Johnson in it, and it's an action movie, and I'm very biased towards action movies, so I thought that looked pretty fun. Speaking of other action movies, we had it, I thought this was really lame, but we had the teaser for the Mission Impossible Fallout trailer in the Super Bowl, they said the real trailer's out right now, we're just not going to show it to you during the Super Bowl, which I get, that's probably saves them a ton of money, and I went and watched the ad, but um, it would have been nice to see it, you know, during during the game. I liked, I've liked all the Mission Possible movies, even the second one, uh, Limp Biscuit included, and, th th like, they just... Some are certainly better than others, and the second one's not one of the best ones by any means. But, like, they just keep coming out, and they're always... They're always good, like, at least. It's like, it's like the Marvel movies. It's like even the worst Marvel movies are, like, okay. And it's like even the worst Mission Impossible movie, which this is six. Um, the sixth one, and like, they're always okay. And they're always at least entertaining, and the action scenes are always good. Uh, we already, earlier last week, the, while they were filming, it was a, a shot of Tom Cruise, Ethan Hunt, jumping between buildings, and Tom Cruise apparently came up short on the jump and broke his ankle, and then he just got up and kept running, and he finished the take, and I was just like, God, oh, that's dedication, like, I really, it would be... I really hope they use that take in the movie, just because that would be so cool every time. Like, like, be like, he broke his ankle right there, and he still, still did it. Tom Cruise has a lot of problems, but like, man, he is dedicated to his roles, and I appreciate that. Ethan Hunt is a fantastic action action character. And keep going. One of the really interesting things was Cloverfield, which Netflix bought from Paramount. This movie had gone through a lot of problems. It was first called God, Part God Particle, and it wasn't even going to be related to Cloverfield, but then it was, and I haven't seen it. I haven't seen, I haven't actually haven't seen any of the Cloverfield movies, but this is a movie, like, that name has recognition value, and they just hadn't really said anything about it, and then Netflix threw out a trailer, said you could watch it, it'll go live right after the game, and that's kind of like the first time we've really seen a, a, a movie be like all right we're having like a big opening release on netflix and so it's it's marketing wise it was incredible that's been like the big discussion around it's just because they just spent a one-time thing just to get that one ad it was an expensive ad sure but it's effective and it'll reach the max audience pretty much any ad ever will and then the movie was just available right after the game to watch and it like it's it's like the conversation is will we see more movies do this i mean paramount comes from a unique position in that they had only like six percent of the market share last year and i mean if we want to go through some of the movies they had last year it was it was a brutal brutal year um but they 
I clearly didn't have a lot of confidence in this film, and so they sold it, which prevents prevents it from being like they they don't have the potential anymore for a breakout hit, but they know that they at least like it didn't it's not gonna bomb at the movie theaters or anything because they got that set amount for it, and that's like. So that's an interesting strategy, but the thing for Netflix is, like, they did this once, and that's, you know, it, it probably is going to work out, because, like, there was such a great ad, you know, I want to say campaign, but just that one ad. But the thing is, is, like, sent, like, the movie by all accounts is awful, and it's cool to have, like, big budget films and a film that could have been released in theaters come out on Netflix and be available to watch right away, but is it gonna like is it gonna keep working if if it they're all bad movies and it just feels like oh like a straight to Netflix movie is pretty much like a straight to DVD movie, which is is kind of what this feels like, and it's just the big uh, producers like scraps that they no longer uh, or the distributor scraps that they don't really have the confidence in to put out in theaters, so they just sell it. Uh, to Netflix, so it'll be interesting to see how much Netflix does this in the future, and and if if publishers, I see, keep saying publishers, um, or keep thinking that uh, distributors keep wanting to do that. I'm sure distributors will want to, but Netflix is probably going to want to be a little more selective in the future if they want people to keep coming back for these because getting them once. That'll happen two times maybe, but if if they keep sucking and it's just going to turn into like a video on demand thing that's not going to draw people in. Going through the Paramount movies from 2017, Monster Trucks, Triple X, The Return of Xander Cage, Ghost in the Shell, Baywatch, Transformers. Transformers actually, of course, actually made a decent amount of money. Um, despite it not being a very good movie, but I mean, Baywatch did terribly, I mean, not terribly, but not really as well as they probably wanted it to, same with Ghost in the Shell, Monster Trucks was bad, Xander Cage, or Triple X was, I think that actually did alright for its budget too, but, then they had Mother, and we, yeah, that was something, same kind of different as me, Daddy's Hope 2, which I think actually did okay, Downsizing, which didn't do very well, and it was yeah, it was a rough year for them. And already uh, n next week, they've got Annihilation coming out, a new Natalie Portman movie, which is based on a book that I can't remember the name of, I think. But that one's actually been released straight to Netflix in a lot of foreign countries in, in, in Europe. But here they're here they're still trusting the the power of Natalie Portman, I guess, to to bring it through. And so that was that was just really uh, really interesting and kind of a story in and of itself, despite the fact that the movie itself is uh, it's not supposed to be very hot. Um, and there's another trailer for The Quiet Place, which is a new horror movie, which I think looks very interesting. Um, Emily Blunt, John Krasinski, uh, John Krasinski also in that Hulu Jack Reacher series, which I, I not, that doesn't really interest me, but. Uh, this this looks it's a very interesting concept that like as long as you're quiet you know they can't they can't find you and they the thing whatever um, but it's it seems it's it's an interesting concept and I've actually enjoyed the trailer despite the fact that I'm not huge into horror movies and then of course the big mamma jamma is a big mamma jamma sorry um, solo trailer we got the teaser on Super Bowl Sunday and then the next morning we got the full trailer and yeah um I it I don't think it, it would, didn't like flash out to me that yeah this is going to suck but it didn't it didn't really surprise me in any way they they kind of to me relied a lot on you know like here's Chewie here's the Millennium Falcon here's here's Lando here's you know these things that you'll recognize didn't really show me anything that will that'll surprise me we got looks at Amelia Clark and um, a little bit of looks at, at Han himself but that's I mean it's gonna be very interesting to see how people react as someone besides Harrison Ford playing Han Solo but 
it, it, it relied a lot on like those familiar things, which is nice, but you know, it was a really exciting when it was The Force Awakens and we hadn't seen those things for 10 years in on the big screen, but now it's just kind of like, yeah, it's cool and, and, and it looks like the action scenes are probably going to be fun, but it, it certainly, it doesn't look like it will be as exciting as the last ones have been and it's, it's history of like problems in production is not doing it any favors and especially that's going to be opening up opening up against a lot of other big films in May. So it, like, I don't know, it'll still make a decent amount of money, uh, for sure, more than decent, but it's, I think it's going to be by far the, the, like, the least of, of the newer Star Wars films, and it's going to be interesting to see how it does stack up. It's going to be going up against Deadpool 2, uh, in, in <laughs> Infinity War, which we also got a teaser for, but that, that didn't really show anything that new to me. Um, yeah, I don't like, yeah, it, it, it's, didn't really change my opinion of the movie that much. Um, all right, I've been talking for half an hour, so I'll give you guys a quick break, uh, give myself a quick break as well, um, and then we'll be right back to finish off with the new releases. We've got three new releases this week. And then finish off with just looking at some of the uh, the biggest Super Bowl openings for movies uh, of all time because I want to. Uh, so thank you for listening. Uh, I'll be right back after a quick break, and you're listening to Radio to Paul Sports, the student voice. Not wow, that was bad. You're listening to Radio to Paul Chicago's College Connection. From cardio kickboxing to spinning, from boot camp to dance. Whatever your workout preference, the group fitness programs at the Ray have tons of offerings. College Connections. Hey, well, welcome back to your weekly movie rewind. As always, I'm your host, Garrett Neal, and you're not listening to Radio DePaul Sports, you're listening to Radio DePaul. Chicago's College Connection. That was oh my god, that was that was terrible. Um I do a couple shows on the uh Radio DePaul Sports side of things and I get Get my get my reads mixed up sometimes, but let's get right back into some movie news. No, it's not news; it's new releases. But we got three releases this weekend. Things are finally starting to crank back up. Nothing that I find too interesting this weekend, although I'm probably will end up seeing a handful of them because I finally finished seeing all of the Best Picture nominated films. I saw the post and the Darkest Hour. And the Phantom Thread this weekend. Yeah, oh, finally, I'm glad to have that done because those, uh, yeah, those are generally not the f funnest films for me to watch. I did enjoy some of them a lot more than I thought I would, but I'll definitely be happy when March comes and I can fill my brain with crappy action movies and comedies once again. But without further ado, I say that way too much on the show. But that, 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 that. let's get. The 1517 to Paris is the first new release this weekend. Looks like it's going to release in about 3,000 theaters. It's, of course, telling the story of the three American soldiers who discovered uh, the terrorist plot um, on the train to Paris um, and dealt with it. And so based on the true story, military film, directed by Clint Eastwood, doesn't have any ratings out right now. So that's not... Not usually a good sign. You want uh, some of those. Uh, usually, it shows that people have confidence, more confidence in their film if they kind of release it early. But uh, I'm sure it'll still do pretty well. Um, it, I mean, it's, it's certainly an interesting story. But we've seen lots of military films with interesting stories, stories to tell, not always be the best movies. So I don't know. I think I'll still probably end up seeing that one. This I, I mean. Whether I see it or not, it's not really a huge barometer because I see, I, I try and I'm gonna try and see almost all the all the new wide release films this year, um, but probably won't get to all of them. So that that one, I mean, if we want to look at box office, what it might do. I mean, I just kind of a, a quick comparison. Twelve Strong, which obviously just came out a couple weeks ago, that one opened at 15 million, and it'll be similar and that it's not really opening up against a whole lot but we'll see um and it's it, so i don't know i think it'll 
it, it doesn't really have any big names behind it outside of Clint Eastwood, and I don't really know if he's even that much of a draw anymore, especially as a director and not as a, an actor, um, which, I mean, he doesn't really do that much acting a anymore, but... Yeah, I, I don't know. That one it shouldn't be... I don't think it'll do too well. I don't think it'll get in the top five, if I'm being honest, but... Actually, no, that's... I think it, it will get into the top five, but it'll probably be, like, fourth or fifth. Um, one movie that is probably going to be number one, unfortunately, is... Uh, it, it is Valentine's Day. It's right around the corner, if you don't know, so uh, get, get prepared for that in, in however way you do. But uh, that means... Fifty Shades Freed is coming out this weekend, and uh, that's in my, from my perspective, you know, not not a fan of the franchise per se. But clearly, there are a lot of people who are, and I'm not going to take that away from them. The first one opened up to 85 million. The second one opened up to 46.6 million. So obviously, big drop off right there, and I think this one will drop off more. But it is the finale, or the climax, if you want to go from the tagline of the film. Uh, <laughs> the I it, so it'll still drop off since it is the final one. Maybe it won't drop off as much. I like I kind of want to see this just because I haven't seen either of the other ones, and I just want to see one of them to see like like how bad is it. Like, is it, because at a certain point, I think people are just bandwagoning on the, like, it's bad train because of what it's about, and once, like, so many people say it's bad, it's like, oh my god, 50 shades, blah, 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 that sucks. So I just kind of want to check it out, but I haven't seen the other ones, so, like, I can't really, can't really talk about it, um, or, like, going into it, the last one would kind of be not great, I mean, I'm sh sure there's not, like, a whole lot to catch up on, but still, that one uh, that one also doesn't have any ratings out right now, which makes perfect sense because, I mean, people will, if you want to talk about, like, rating bombs, people will give this 0 out of 10 stars or 0% really quick just because it's 50 shades, and people will, will I think it actually has, like, a 3 on IMDb right now, but I don't even trust that because I don't think those people that rated it have even seen the movie for the most part. Um, so yeah, that one's opened up in 3,700 theaters. That's probably going to be number one next week, even despite the fact that I think like it's going to drop off. But even like even if it gets half of what it made last week, I that'll be I, that'll just be easily enough for number one. I think because all the I mean, all, like, the big movies that are out right now have been out for a long time. I mean, talking about Jumanji and Greatest Showman will be going into week eight, which is going to show how amazing the staying power for those have been. And one thing in Jumanji is the first film since Titanic to open in December and still have uh, a number one week in January. And... Yeah, which, I mean, wow, that's, I think, I, I know I saw, like, I think I'm probably saying that wrong. It did have, uh, there was a weird stat between Titanic and Jumanji, but I think I, I said it wrong. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and look it up as I keep rambling on about the new releases. The final new release this weekend is uh, Peter Rabbit, uh, of course, loosely based on Beatrix Potter's book, Children's Story. Well, I, I loved that book growing up, and I was like, I, oh, I read it all the time. And now they're making a movie out of it that's an hour and 30 minutes long. Don't know how they do that, but, you know, whatever. And they're like, okay, let's take Peter Rabbit, just a nice story about a rabbit that wants some vegetables, kind of had to learn his lesson a little bit. And it was cute and fun, and now we're gonna like, all right, let's throw in. We're gonna, it's gonna be live action with CGI bunnies, and we're gonna have potty humor, and we're gonna have over the top physical humor that's not actually funny, 
and we're gonna have innuendos and it's like like why like that that's not that's not what the book was about at all at all and it just looks like a, like the most basic dumb kids movie that you could like oh my gosh oh so frustrating it looks like it's gonna be like the smurfs movie except replace the blue people with with fuzzy fuzzy things with noses and, and tails that eat carrots um james corden will be the voice of pizza the rabbit uh margot robbie's flopsy um she is in it that's cool won't see her face though because you know she'll be a bunny um daisy ridley so it's got some names behind it and it's like i can't like you'd think that kids movies would have a huge market right now but then i keep remembering that paddington 2 which is like supposed to be an amazing movie apparently and that one has not been doing super hot at the box office even though the first one was supposed to be pretty good and that one had a decent box office run i i like at this point i kind of want to see them just because they it seems like they're supposed to be really cute and, and fun movies um i would have gone to see the second one but i haven't seen the first one yet um but so I don't know how well Peter Rabbit will do and does have some ratings in it has a 50 Metascore rating does have a 58 on Rotten Tomatoes does have a 7.1 on uh, IMDB so you know I guess there's that but I'm sure that will go down because again the opening ratings are always usually higher than what they will finish up as um, I, yeah, I, I kind of feel bad about giving out the ratings when they're there because I know like the ratings are now out and reviews are coming out for Black Panther and I am avoiding those like the plague, man. I got I got my ticket for Thursday. I don't want to know anything. I've seen the trailers. That's all I need to know because the trailers, I think it's important to see the trailers of any movie going into it because it gets you an idea of what like the distributor wants you to be thinking about going into it. So it kind of sets your expectations for what you're going to see. And then you just go into it. I don't want to know what other people are thinking. After I see the movie, then I'll like read what other people are thinking and read those reviews and be like, oh, well, I saw something similar, but I interpret it this way. Or, yeah, I agree with that. Or, you know, whatever. But before, I don't want to. So, yeah. Sorry. If, if you were really invested in Peter Rabbit, I'm sorry about that. But that's going to be our new releases. But before we close, I wanted to just go through uh one quick top five the top five openings in super bowl weekend history number one no ooh, number one why would we start there come on start with number five when a stranger calls opened up this is a open in 2006 open to 21.6 million dollars this was a uh, sony distributed horror film i had not heard of this um but apparently had a had a good opening weekend but was very front loaded uh after that it, it only made uh 26 000, or 26, 26 million after that opening weekend um domestically so that was uh, certainly front-loaded film, um, but did enough to do a solid, solid opening weekend. Um, has a 27 Metascore rating and a 5.1 on IMDb. Uh, doesn't have any, no one I recognize in it. Uh, Tessa Thompson's in it. I know who that is. Um, yeah, wow. Must have been must have been a star of box office that weekend, way back in two thousand six. Number four, I have heard of Chronicle, uh, came out to twenty two million. This was two thousand twelve, and that was of course uh, the superhero ish movie um, where like these guys find the object and like it gives them powers. Um, very interesting concept, but not like the greatest movie but it wasn't bad it certainly wasn't bad i can definitely understand i didn't see that one in theaters but i can definitely understand um that that opening weekend um written by 
Uh, of course, Max Landis, who is now infamous for Bright and some other things, had Dane DeHaan in it. I forgot about. I forgot he was in that. Um, and Michael B. Jordan. I forgot. Wow, I forgot he was in that too. Uh, yeah, that was kind of where I think that might have been the first thing I saw him in. But uh, yeah, number f three, Taken, the OG Taken back in 09, 24 million. Oh, so great. Then that one was one that had a like that. I mean, that was because it's coming out like that one didn't have super high expectations, but that one ended up grossing 145 million domestic. After, like, just exploding off that opening weekend. That one totally makes sense. Oh, my God. Taken. Great action movie if you haven't seen it. If, like, any kind of action fan. At, like, you have to have seen it at this point. Coming in at number two. Dear John. The, uh... Channing Tatum romance movie. That one came out in 2010. Uh, Amanda Seyfried. Seyfried as well. Uh... Like, I... I... I don't know why I like that one at 30.5 million that one doesn't really make sense to me um it's not supposed to be the greatest movie in the world 43 meta score 6.3 on IMDB uh I like I, mm, I don't know I guess it hit that romance audience again this usually isn't a big time for movies so it must have been going against some weak some weak stuff i don't know let's yeah I th from from paris with love was the other uh was the other big release that weekend which i have not heard of at all i don't know i don't know that one confuses me, but number one makes perfect sense to me. Number one Super Bowl opening of all time. Hannah Montana slash Miley Cyrus Best of Both Worlds concert tour opened up to $31 million in 2008. <laughs> back, in, back in the day. Oh man, that's, that's, that's a throwback. How far things have come uh, for... Miley Cyrus since then and Hannah Montana is is no more unfortunately and that was ugh. that's very that's very interesting uh yeah I just thought that, that was an interesting list of things to things to look at during a, a week that's there's not usually a ton of movies coming out this time of year end of January beginning of February and it's definitely not a big movie weekend so it's just interesting to look at some of those box office um it's actually kind of interesting that taken did that well for a super bowl weekend because you think about like the main audience for that film is going to be middle-aged guys and middle-aged guys is also the biggest audience for the super bowl so i don't know but i i guess i mean no one's really seeing movies here in the super bowl so like no nah, i don't know it 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 did it but it, it makes sense that there's not a it makes sense that a lot of these films are not geared toward the uh, the male audience as much. And then we get horror movies, because horror movies just always do well. I don't know why, but they do. Um, that's going to do it. We're going to end a little bit early this week. Thank you for listening uh, to your weekly movie rewind. We'll be back next week, and we'll be able to see how well Fifty Shades did. We'll talk about the new releases uh, coming out that week, which we got, we got, we got a notable one, Black Panther, might have heard of that one, we also got Early Man, a new one from Ardman Studios that I'm excited about, so join me then, um, until then, I am Garrett Neal, and you're listening to Radio DePaul, Chicago's College Connection.